That's awesome. And I think, you know, the, our, our topic for today is networks of trust. Um, we have, uh, you know, single sign-on identity access management uh, has been a thing for a long time and it's now the new layer of a digital identity and 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 I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of shared conversation for, between technology and 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 the operations especially in a post covid world where yeah. all of a sudden you know in Canada we did a report in January uh, with 77 companies, uh, exempt market dealers across Canada, three of them had plans to do some sort of technology improvement this year. Uh, so of course with COVID, they are now uh, all 77, 77 of them uh, have to make changes in how they manage uh, their workforce remotely, um, but then also their clients remotely as well. And, and that kind of can create some new opportunities. Um, Mike, can you go next? <clears throat> Sure, yeah, Mike Brown with ATB Financial. We're a, a regional bank in Western Canada. Um, I've led our blockchain work for the past three and a half years. And um, the biggest focus with that ended up being our digital identity work. So we began that about three years ago, working with self-sovereign identity, and then built out a network of other organizations across the province that we call the Alberta Credential Ecosystem, where we're working together to test out uh, self-sovereign identity credentials. Also um, initiated and was able to get moving on our um, banking of crypto businesses. So we actively bank some exchanges and uh, mining operations as well. Very cool. And I know um, we had, uh, we, we went live here uh, as we started. So I'd like to continue the introductions as we go around, but also welcome. Uh, everyone who's joining us um, across uh, whatever network uh, you're connecting in from. Uh, this is a, a live AMA style. So if you want to submit any questions, uh, you have any questions around digital identity uh, the to with the topic of networks of trust, we have people here from across the aisle of technology, uh, finance, uh, and, and different industries. So we've just had a chance to chat a little bit with each other, um, but maybe as we uh, as we do an introduction uh, here, I'd like to also kind of um, maybe ask a question of, of each of you of kind of what is your, you know, when you think of digital identity, uh, you know, what, how would you sum, sum up a, a question like what is a digital identity? Uh, and maybe we can start um, Nathan with you and, and continue around, uh, uh, or sorry, uh, yeah, Nate, uh, Mike, uh, Kevin, pardon me, with you, and then we can continue through the, through the panel. Sure. So I think there's, I think it's several things when I think of digital identity. Um, and that's, I guess that has to do, everybody's going to think of something different based on their background. Coming from financial services, obviously there's the, the low hanging fruit digital identity, just simply meaning I can identify you digitally and I don't need you to go through some onerous process to onboard with my financial institution. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to go send me an apostled uh, passport copy or a notarized, you know, phone bill. Um, to try and, and verify um, your address, which is not really verifiable with a notarized phone bill. Uh, so, so on that level, that, I think that's the low-hanging fruit. But from another level, and I think Ian touched on this a bit, it's, a lot of it comes back to uh, fraud protection. It comes back to making sure, not just when we onboard somebody, but that digital identity actually sticks with them. Uh, and it, it comes back when they're making withdrawals, deposits, when they're interacting with, with, let's say, our platform. We understand we're always working with the person we're supposed to be working with. Um, I don't know if I, I, just just to touch on that, there's been large scale scandals which necessarily haven't made it to the public as of yet. But at things like N26, Revolut and other uh, businesses across uh, the tech spectrum where people will go and buy accounts. So somebody would onboard through a, an onerous or not so onerous onboarding process at a bank or a fintech and then sell the account to someone who starts to basically onboard or offboard funds that come from, let's say, nefarious means. And because the client was onboarded once, they never check again. Um, and that's that's something that obviously that, that I think of a lot when I think of digital identity. Just it's a, it's not necessarily someone's you know digital passport. I guess you could think of it that way. Um, but essentially, it's so that we can identify you through the entire prop. When you log in, when you log out, when you're operating within our systems, we know who you are. We can verify who you are. It's kind of like a digital fingerprint that follows you. Not only that, but from institution to institution. I think the end goal for most of us is to have some form of accredited digital sovereign identity that's recognized by governments, that's recognized um, by multiple large-scale financial institutions that other institutions can then use um, so that we can have a pseudo-anonymous 
relationship with our clients, but at the same time, understand who they are um, and have enough information to be able to track and audit those, those funds, transfers, et cetera, when they, when they go in between institutions. Something like the travel rule has tried to do with the FATF and failed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Radhika, can, what, what are your thoughts? Oh, I, I don't think we can hear you. Let me unmute myself. Um, yeah. yeah, to add to what uh, Kevin was talking about, um, when I think of digital identity, and, and this is like we're at a great point in time, I think the pandemic has really brought digital everything front and center. But ultimately what it comes down to for me is uh, there's control and then there's ownership, right? So there's there's two different aspects. And I think Mike, you touched on this as well. So it's, it's self-sovereign, uh, which means that you have control over it, but it's also the decentralized identifiers, which is which gives you the control and ownership of something. So it's actually, it's the opposite. The self-sovereign identity gives you the ownership and then the DIDs give you the control. So I think those two aspects are very, very important because it's not just about owning your own credential, your own ID. It's about being able to have control over disseminating it, sharing it for how long, with whom, et cetera. And all of those control factors, I think are incredibly important. Um, the other thing that I think we focus on when we talk about digital identity is, is personal identity, right? Our, us as individuals. But you think about enterprise and you think about um, an identity of a corporation. I mean, how is that established, you know, through your documents, for example, of, of articles of incorporation or shareholder documents or what have you. And so when you're talking about uh, enterprise or corporate identity, that being, brings in another layer of complexity and how do you bet, um, uh, authenticate that, validate that and so on. And that digital fingerprint that Kevin talked about really has to be something and, and we're really seeing, back to your point, Matthew, about networks of trust, we're really seeing a brand new way of doing something. And we can talk about it later through the panel, but I think that those networks of trust where you have uh, certain parties on the network that are going to be identifiers on the network, those are going to provide that authentication um, in a corporate environment. So there's the personal side as well as the corporate side, and hopefully we'll touch on both. Mm -hmm. Nathan? Yeah, I, uh, I agree. I think when you look at digital ID, it's, it has such a wide variety of applications and considerations in terms of control and ownership and privacy as it relates to all of that as well. Because I think digital identity started when people were just putting information out on the internet, right? And up over the past decades, that digital identity has been developing whether they know it or not, whether they can see it or not. And so these types of initiatives surrounding, and I know especially in the EU, uh, they've been very concerned with GDPR and other initiatives to try to try to rein that in a little bit of how can people and individuals control that a little bit better. And I think this just carries on to how can you control and own your digital ID as Radhika said. Um, but as from the company perspective, you look at that as well of, okay, this is, as long as it's backed within our regulatory environment, we're a regulated entity at Zafter. So we have rules that we need to follow. But as long as it's put together in a way that it's verifiable and decentralized and you can rely on it, it puts the control in the hands of the customer who's able to much more easily prove that they are who they say they are. And from an anti-fraud perspective, as Kevin was mentioning as well, that you should be able to, if it's done properly, verify it on an ongoing basis. Yes, this is still coming from that same digital ID and we can rest assured because of how this is put together that we're still dealing with that same person. And that also protects okay. the companies as well because a lot of times you have issues uh, with law enforcement when you're dealing with digital fraud where they're saying, well, how can I charge them because the evidentiary basis isn't there because yes, it's the IP address, but I need to prove that they're the ones at that computer. I need to prove that it could be through a VPN. It could be other things like that. So. It, it really, um, when done properly, I think that there's so much benefit there, both from a personal standpoint to be able to control your digital identity and have that ownership, uh, but also from a company perspective for 
ease of process and for security and anti-fraud measures. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's important to understand that it's not a, uh, you know, one time thing necessarily, you know, uh, you know, with the concept of a digital identity, starting with the beginning of the internet and putting your own information on the internet, you really don't, uh, you don't have a lot of, um, uh, you, you, there's a lot of examples where people can post photos of someone else and it's part of, it's not their identity, but it's now uh, attached to, you know, it's impacting someone else's identity. And I think the concept of digital identity is always, uh, from a fraud perspective, is always a, an ongoing thing. Was the user at the point of that transaction actually in front of the screen or did they get up, uh, go to the washroom and their two-year-old climb up over top of their laptop and sign the DocuSign? Uh, you know, there's, 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 uh, you know, really uh, key information around who is the actual person at that moment that you don't uh, get in the digital world today. That is why we have so many key meetings face to face. Uh, it seems, uh, Ian, uh, it would be great to hear your your thoughts on this. Yeah, and and so so thanks, Matt, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be here and and to chat about it because I think digital identity is is a key topic when we're talking about remote work, when we're talking about moving, you know, majority of these um, historically in-person businesses online. So I think the first thing is just to distinguish between, uh, between two different concepts. And so the first concept is the identity proofing when you're first uh, engaging with uh, uh, an entity, whether that's a, a bank or a business or something of that nature, and the question is really around how do we identify this person and make sure that they are the right person? So we we've done that historically by scanning a passport or or some something of that nature. And so that really addresses the KYC um, requirements of making sure that the person who just logged in for the first time is in fact the person that we have been able to validate is over the age of eighteen, lives in a certain jurisdiction, um, and has the right parameters that we're looking for to sell them a product or to invest into a product or something of that nature. And so that identity proofing um, is very different than authentication, which is, okay, we've created that account and now we want to make sure that it's the same person who's coming back to that account on a regular basis. And so the tools that you use for, for the former are very different than the latter. Um, and I think when you get into more of an authentication question, um, it's really a, a two-sided coin because you're dealing not only with uh, authentication uh, in the sense that it needs to be secure. You need to have a high level of assurance that the, the protocol or the process you're using to authenticate an individual is robust uh, and you can rely on that. Uh, to your point, it's not the two-year-old who's just docu-signed the, the agreement. Um, but at the same time, it also needs to be usable. And so I, I usually joke that when somebody wants to make a, a system secure, it's actually very straightforward. You encase a computer in concrete and throw it in the ocean. Uh, it becomes very, very secure. It becomes entirely unusable. And so you have to balance between that security and usability. And it becomes, uh, it becomes really, really important because if the process you're using is not usable, users will find a way around it. And frankly, users can be the customer. Users can also be a, a frontline bank manager who's just trying to do their job and they need to get the thing done and they have to circumvent or go around the authentication process you've established. So um, so I think it's important to distinguish those two things. And I think that there are um, certainly innovations on both sides with identity proofing um, as well as authentication. My personal lens and certainly the lens of Plurlock is more around the authentication space. Of, of providing tools for financial institutions to be able to better authenticate people. Um, but I'm, I'm looking forward to, to diving in in more detail on this. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah thanks for having me as well. Um, for me, you know, digital identity really breaks down into the two, you know, the two words from the digital side. I think the, the key thing there is, is trust. And you know, as we've talked about, the internet's been around for you know, 30 plus years, you know, between email and the World Wide Web and all these wonderful things, you know, this digital world we live in has existed for 30 years. Yet for 30 years, we've never actually established a foundation where we can have digital trust. So I think that's the, the one important thing, you know, hacks happen all the time and our data, my name, my birthday, my social insurance number, my mother's maiden name, <clears throat> all that data about me is out there. 
and yet we still are reliant on that as ways of proving who we are. So I think the, the first piece with the digital is the, the trust and really establishing a way where we can exist online and interact online in a way that we can trust uh, who we're interacting with. And then the identity piece, um, you know, identity is often really that, you know, proof of who I am and that, you know, that government issued ID or, you know, my relationship with a bank. But I think identity can be expanded to a whole bunch of different things. It can be my education. It can be my, you know, <clears throat> my preferences, my, my gaming, you know, personas, whoever I am. Those are all different aspects of my identity. But it's important that you can kind of connect that identity component, whatever it is, with trust. So whoever you're interacting with online can, can know and believe that information. There's definitely a, a balance between, you know, the concept of security and, and the level of trust and security versus uh, a viable online user experience. <laughs> I think we've all used uh, some things that are really cumbersome. Um, I, I don't know, when, when you think of um, going through an, a proofing process, uh, the KYC process, uh, yourself personally, you know, are there certain thresholds that you that you've seen in workflows that you just personally feel, uh, you know, like how how far how much personal information are you willing to uh, to document and and and, and do digitally uh, in in your own personal um, onboarding experiences? Do you find that some of them are too invasive, or do you think that uh, they're actually um, adequate? I, I'd be curious, just from people in the panel yeah. in general. Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in there. So, um, I think. To me, it often and maybe falsely depends on the organization or who I'm interacting with. And you know, being a bit in this space, I am kind of judging the system they're using and what information they're asking more, me for. If I've, I've gone through some KYC processes where I abandoned it halfway through because you know they're asking for <clears throat> you know me to maybe log in using a bank credential or um, you know other information they're asking for, you know, even my driver's license, and I'm going. I don't know or trust how they're storing this. You know, I'm putting this information out there, a photo of my ID, uh, you know, a video of myself, and I don't know where they're storing it. And once it's put out there and stored, anybody can use that exact same information if it gets hacked. So to me, it's trying to assess, you know, the platform, the organization, and the information they're asking for. I wanted to jump in, if I could, um, to tack on to what um, Mike was talking about. And I think you bring up a really good point, which is that initial point of proofing. Well, first of all, you're right. Identity is multifaceted, right? Because it's not just a single thing that we're talking about. There's a legal identity. There's a financial identity. There's a healthcare, health record identity. There's multiple identities that we have out there. Um, but, you know, in terms of that proofing point, I mean, I think the distinction we have to think about is currently it's it's all centralized systems, right? It's, it's the, you know, the the central proofing point is a, is a centralized organization, right? And so I think that, you know, right now, I think that's a big distinction in terms of the way we have been doing it, which is faulty, which has all of these risks uh, associated with it. The fraud is skyrocketing uh, faster than we can ever imagine uh, at great magnitudes. And so, you know, the future of where we're moving is to that decentralized, uh, you know, proofing point, if you will. So really the control and access and ownership really happens. Yes, there's going to be an entity, you know, government is going to be involved, for example, in legal identity. So whether it's a passport or um, a driver's license or what have you, there's going to be an issuing body that is authorized to, to, to issue that document. But once it's been issued, it's yours and it's by private key. And, you know, it's going to point to our identifying uh, credentials, but it's not going to be the credential. So I think that the future of where we're moving, that's a big big point right there is where we have been doing it or how we have been doing it, which is very centralized to a more decentralized and private key uh, mechanism where we have the authority and we have the control over that document. And we're not really actually putting that document in, in, in its entirety out there. Like you said, like a, 
my photo, my identity, my driver's license, my passport, whatever it is that they're asking of me. Um, and I, I agree with you. That's the that's the big risk we have is what exists out there. Everything really about us is out there. I, I just to jump in as well on the point, because having been in kind of financial services geared toward retail investors for 20 something years, I think I've seen every single possible fraud or deception when it comes to an onboarding process. And but what I also see is that when we talk about, let's say, I think Radhika, where she was going was obviously blockchain solutions, decentralized solution to store identification, whether that be some type of private key issued by a government or some other type of I would call them more like risk scoring me me mechanisms where you have an identity that was given to you by or a name that was given to you by your parents that was tied to an identity given to you by a government. Everything else below that is a risk score. So your financial identity, your gamer profiles, all these things tally up into some type of risk score, at least from a from from me as a let's say looking at it from a financial perspective. But the problem that that decentralization has, at least now, is the UI UX behind any decentralized type of application right now, user experience is absolutely horrendous. The learning curve on how to use those things is terrible. It's very, I mean, imagine right now if you had, you know, you're uh, an 85 year old that you said had to have a private key linked back to, it, and they actually had to have this some, maybe they had it on a, you know, on some type of a carbon fiber card in a safe somewhere. So there's, we have a, I think we have a, in all of crypto and, and, and blockchain in general, outside of the IDs, but even inside of this kind of sovereign identification method, mechanisms that many companies are working on, we still have a user experience problem. The user experience problem on, on regular onboarding, on traditional onboarding sucks. That's for sure. And no matter how much you stream, I saw something on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago about how you onboard with a bank and how many clicks it takes, right? And you had going from Revolut of 27 clicks, I think it was, down to HSBC, or I think it was HSBC, you know, 7,847,000 clicks or something like that. Um, and, you know, onboarding processes are horrendous, partially and majorly due to regulations, which are also due to legislation. So like in most things that have to do with identity or the reasons why you have to prove your identity, which in many cases are financial transactions, when you talk about online having to prove your identity, that's why you're doing it, right? To gain access to something, to make a payment, receive a payment, make a trade, uh, open a bank account, et cetera. Um, all those things tie back to regulatory and, and, and legislative, and they're always behind the curve. So, you know, we, we're, we're trying to build these things that create a better user experience, but we're still held back by, you know, somebody mentioned GDPR, GDPR and blockchain don't mix at all. Um, you know, there, there's, there's many things around the, that, that happen around the world that we get held back from, you know, innovation does get stifled. And part of that is definitely due to the fact that we, I think we move too fast and don't explain, like we don't lobby enough. We don't, we don't lobby enough to the people that actually need to make those legislative changes so that regulators um, can actually do a better job at helping us mm. do a better job. Well, and we also seem to have, uh, you know, we do, we have a history of not always uh, adopting the best technology. Uh, you know, when you look at, you know, how the foundations of how we built the internet, uh, you know, identity is is uh, is kind of in shambles uh, as far as uh, the concept of what we want with a digital identity. Uh, and the and so as we're looking at how do we handle, you know, and the, the internet of value, the money flowing over over these networks, uh, as you mentioned, you know, some of the blockchain and cryptocurrency networks, but then also dealing with some of the more uh, more traditional networks, uh, right down to uh, remote work environments for for banks that now have COVID work policies. Uh, you know, there's I think verification. Uh, workflows that they have to go through uh, probably on a daily basis. Uh, I don't know, Ian, if you have any any thoughts on like how is how is the user uh, being handled uh, for companies that have to deal with this stuff remotely now? Well, uh, so it's a good question. I think it's hard, right? At the end of the day, I think most uh, legacy financial institutions had developed a series of processes and controls that assumed that people would be in a secure office environment. And so when you go from people having to card in or badge in on the way through the turnstile to get into the to the office, you go upstairs, you have a physical key you use to unlock an office if, if you're senior and you're lucky and you don't have a huge open office uh, space. Um, and then you sit down at your terminal and you probably control alt delete, you put in your login and password and then you start working. Well, if you're now sending everybody home because you're required to, 
uh, you no longer have the physical security of the turnstile on the badge. You probably don't have that security guard who's who's casually scanning people as they go back and forth. You don't have the physical key. You don't have any of the CCTV cameras. Um, and so you're losing a lot of those controls. And so the, the, the question then is, how do you get commensurate or comparable trust that it's the right people who are coming in and accessing systems when you lose those controls? And it's hard. And so what we're seeing, particularly with our clients and, and certainly other folks in the financial services industries, is that they're having to adapt very quickly. Now, for uh, for the uh, trusted users, so this could be the employees, it could be a contractor, it could be a third party that's working at a financial institution. Um, you know, there are there are things you can do. You can deploy uh, continuous monitoring systems. Uh, there are, um, I mean, certainly additional authentication systems you can deploy to get more of a um, a, a real-time look and visibility into is it the right person doing the right thing continuously throughout the day, um, but it requires a change of mindset. And so, whereas uh, you know in the old days you used to just be able to fall back on, well, you've got a long, long and strong password right of twelve characters. Well, it doesn't actually do you that much good if you're logging in once at nine o'clock in the morning from home and then you leave that terminal open. Um, what's been interesting is that with with the work from home. Uh, uh, changes is that some of the, uh, you know, we go back to that security versus convenience question. Some of the policies are getting relaxed. So as an example, um, you would hope that you log in once every time per day, at least. Um, but because of uh, connectivity issues, because you don't actually want to interrupt people who are working remotely, um, they're not forcing people to log off. And so it's possible that you could log in nine o'clock in the morning and have that session persist all throughout the week. And so you really only have one kick at the can to validate is it actually the right bank employee who's wiring $20 million worth of funds? Or is it, uh, is it your spouse who's trying to check Facebook and accidentally opens the CRM? Well, now you've got a massive data privacy problem, right? So, so that's the shift that we're seeing and, and people having to uh, security teams specifically having to react and, and deal with the fact that you can't depend on those historically physical networks of trust with all of the mm -hmm. physical controls. You now have to go completely digital. And so what does that mean in today's environment? I guess the just if I can make one quick comment, just what Ian said, because obviously we we struggle with both of those things. I mean, as a as a crypto entity, we're a little more decentralized than most traditional financial firms. So we already had lots of policies in place for how to deal with remote work because we have a lot of remote workers. But I guess the at least from an identification or authentication standpoint, when you're dealing with your workers, it can be a bit more onerous. You don't necessarily need to think so much about the user experience because these people have to log in to be able to do their work. So yeah, it might be a bit onerous. Yeah, they might not like it, but it's not the same focus that you have to put on the front end when you're dealing with your end clients. End clients, obviously, you need. there's a whole different you know workflow you have to think about because if an if end client doesn't like the flow to have to authenticate themselves or they're being asked for some, some additional information or, or whatever during either that onboarding or, or any type of authentication flow, then they can leave. Uh, whereas, whereas the employee doesn't necessarily have that benefit um, if they don't like the UX of you know, the back office. So. I, I don't know. So, so let, me, let me just respond to that. So, um, I mean, I think panels are boring if we all agree all the time. So I think <laughs> I'm, I'm going to take the other side of that. Um, we actually had a client, and it was it was a bank. It was a it was a mid sized bank in the Northeast, and the problem statement was their employees were quitting because their IT systems were too hard to use. And so I think that it's it's easy to kind of fall back on the assumption that like, well, their employees. I mean, you can just order them to do what they they need to do. Um, we see this a lot in FedGov as well. So we've we've done a, a number of um, we've done considerable work with the U.S. federal government. And my assumption going into it was, well, this is easy. Like they're soldiers, you just order them to do it and they have to do it. Mm -hmm. I think the reality is that uh, users, regardless of their customers or if they're employees uh, are crafty. And if they face a roadblock and they're required to do something, they'll just go around it. And so um, the, the particular bank in question uh, had, uh, had as, a, as a corporate value that they wouldn't let things get in their way. And unfortunately, it was the security getting in their way and their employees were getting around it. And so I think that you have to treat users, regardless of what the employment relationship is, or even just the relationship period, 
as as a user, you you have to be able to accommodate uh, their workflows. And if they don't like it, you're going to have problems elsewhere. I think also when you're when you're working with larger institutions, kind of more more of the you know tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of employees. In a lot of cases, the IT teams are are viewing their internal employees as as their customer. So they're they're a stakeholder that they are beholden to. And and frankly, I mean they can't expend all their political capital to force a really onerous security policy in place um, because they're not going to be able to get anything done. And so I, I, would, I would, I would just to comment again, cause yeah, I, I love panels where there's a bit of contention because if not, right. if I'm watching it, I just kind of start to nod off after a while. So just to go to your point, I, I would agree with most of that, except I think there's also usually a big issue with larger companies with segmentation of duties and just how they run their own internal policies. I'm not saying every every user should have to go through onerous login checks, but the guy that's going to send the 20 million wire, that guy's going to go through some onerous checks if he's remote working remotely. Uh, and to be honest, he's probably getting paid a salary that's at a decent enough level. And hopefully he's getting treated and, and the rest of the business works well enough that those onerous checks, he's going to understand why those are in place, especially when he's working remotely. I mean, if you have people that are dealing with just email, contesting emails or customer support, and they have to authenticate themselves every three minutes. Yeah, that's a problem. And, and that, that should be dealt with. But that also comes from just general policy arrangements and segmentation of duties inside of that business as well. And I think I know what bank you're talking about. Um, so, I mean, big, big banks, um, the, the, the several that are found in the Northeast of the United States have many systemic issues. Um, that's for sure. And I'm sure some of it does stem from their systems, but lots of it stems from just their internal policies and how they actually, they operate on a very antiquated well, policy. Uh, you know. That's a that's a, it's actually um, I think a really valid point. Some of the different jurisdictions you mentioned, you know, the Northeast, the U.S., uh, and you know, to this point, there's some jurisdictions we're able to do more digitally than others. Uh, you know, even in thinking uh, like where can you actually accept an e-signature? Uh, where will a law society uh, accept an e-signature? Uh, and what what sort of method uh, would would they accept as an example? So there's a lot of um, you know. Uh, there's a there's a lot of variability around what can be done in different parts of the world. Uh, from the concept of digital ID, uh, you know, uh, what what sort of jurisdictions are, are areas that you can actually use this in a in a in a in a client facing way, uh, in the way that we're talking about, uh, you know, a more decentralized way, uh, you know, something along those lines. I'd love to hear uh, different people's thoughts on different jurisdictions out there. So. Maybe I, 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 if I can, I'll jump in on this one. I, I'm sitting in Estonia. So those that don't know, Estonia was, now they, they say that their systems are built on blockchain. That's a bit of PR. They're not. They're built on a system that derives from Merkle tree, but it's a, some type of distributed ledger technology. So but they did it in 2006 on the back of uh, hacking attempts by the Russian government. So in 2006, a company called Guard Time here in Estonia started a project that led to the digitalization of all government documentation, including IDs, health records, police, everything. Um, and it was done, yeah, 2006. So way before there was a blockchain, uh, the term hadn't even been coined yet, pun intended. Um, so Estonia has been on the, on the cutting edge or was on the cutting edge of digital ID since 2006. And now as, a, as living here, as a resident, um, I was an e-resident originally when that when that program rolled out. I didn't know I was coming to Estonia, but I thought it was rather unique. And and, and just to acquire it, I, I paid for it and acquired an, a, a, a you know e-resident card. I never thought I would use it, but I thought it was unique and I wanted to go through the process, so I did. Now that I'm actually a resident, I can tell you that from a e-signature standpoint, or having to you know, I can use my ID card inserted into my computer to access any single piece of documentation, the licenses for my business, renew them, which I just had to do on July 1st, actually, with the adaptation of the fifth anti-money laundering directive, or if I have to sign any documentation, whether that be something as simple as signing a payment or something as complex as, I don't know, signing a mortgage, all of it's done with the same ID. And that ID mm -hmm. has been transported over to a mobile ID as well. So just for my cell phone, I can, any any, any service I need to access, I get a, a text that's linked, not a text, but actually a pop-up that's linked to my SIM card which is linked to my digital identification. And then I have to authenticate myself using a system of pin codes. So everybody mm -hmm. has two to four different pin codes tied to different signature types. And since this has been around now here for over a decade, 
it's 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 100 you know everyone uses it whether they're 90 or whether they're you know 18 just in the first time signing everyone uses it no one no one does not use the digital signature or digital element of, the, of, of society they use everybody for absolutely everything it's it's the, was the first country to do it obviously now there's countries and cities around the world that have adopted similar um identification actually there's a push in europe called eid um which now the netherlands and a few other countries are a part of uh, but estonia was the first at least in the, the when, EU. So, Kevin, when you're looking at, uh, you know, saying, okay, with this, the way things are handling in Estonia today, everybody uses it. It's, it's used across the board. How do they handle uh, scenarios <clears throat> where, let's say, somebody is uh, older and and has dementia and can no longer remember their their uh, their pins and their keys, or 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 incapacitated in some way? How do you handle a fully digital ID? How does that handled so in Estonia today? So like most things in, let's say, the novice things or things that, are, that aren't necessarily traditional, you fall back on the traditional, which means there are still wills, which hopefully when they created their will or created any type of documentation that would give power of attorney to, a, to someone else, they did that when they were still of well mind and body. If they're not and they had never done that, then it's the same procedure that you go through in any traditional manner, uh, meaning that you're going to end up in a court of law, you're going to end up in front of some arbitration, you're going to end up in in front of some, you know, someone that's going to make a decision uh, to find out who who can act in the best interest of that individual. Um, but leading up to that, hopefully, before that happens, before the person actually can't act for themselves, they would have digitally signed <laughs> over uh, rights or power of attorney to someone else who they can then act on their behalf. Yeah, I, I know in Sweden they've been dealing with this for quite some time. Is there's there are points of failure in these systems where people have to, you know, have to have that plan laid in place beforehand or, or they become you know, no longer access to e-money or, or things like that. Um, I'm curious, just uh, I know there's several people here. Uh, I'm based in Canada. I know several other people here are based in Canada. Uh, we in British Columbia have uh, a digital ID service through uh, the, uh, British Columbia, and we also share that with things like our, our federal government services. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, do you use a lot of these digital IDs? Do you think a lot of these digital ID services will be brought together when we see in Canada as a very fragmented system versus Estonia, you know, one thing for access to everywhere? I think maybe I'll, I'll jump in there as well. Um, also from Canada based in Alberta. And I think, you know, just so far as jurisdictions right now, I think BC is probably the furthest ahead within Canada. I think they're doing a lot of work in particular on self-sovereign identities. So in addition to the BC services card, there is you know, self-sovereign identity work taking place within the BC government, including the issuance of um, verifiable credentials for businesses. So business licenses and business um, permits um, are, you know, have been put on self-sovereign identity based credentials. Uh, within Alberta, I think we are <clears throat> kind of next in line within Canada and we've uh, also have a digital identity system within the Alberta government that's also federated um, up to the federal government. So there is some federation taking place there. And then we also have the self-sovereign identity work that's underway currently. So I think there's quite a few examples taking place. I think Canada, um, you know, DIAC, the Digital Identity Access Control Canada um, group has the um, Pan-Canadian Trust Framework, which has done a lot of work to really establish that um, foundation of trust between different levels of both government and private sector. Um, so there's lots of great work taking place kind of on the federal level, but uh, really being driven on a provincial basis. I don't think the, I don't think that fragmentation actually will cause any problems because within Canada, the provinces are the authorities of identity. Um, the the foundation is your provincial identity, so that the digital identity built on top of that matches the actual model that is the legal framework in Canada. Yeah, and just to touch on what uh, Mike was talking about, I think you kind of have the two different elements of it. One is, do you have a way to create that digital ID where it is issued by a governmental body that would be recognized and um, would be done appropriately. And then the others for a regulated entity such as ours is, okay, are we able to rely on that? Or is it still behind? So it's great that it's there, but 
based on the legislation that was put in place two years ago, it doesn't recognize that. So other than anti-fraud measures, which are kind of a cherry on top, our regulatory compliance can't rely on that. And we need to stick with the older procedures in order to make sure that we're actually complying with our regulatory requirements. I'll yeah, just definitely there's a, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead Ian. I was just going to say, you know, I think I think some of the things that I find um, super fascinating are both the the top down, um, you know, governmental initiatives, but also some of the uh, industry initiatives. So I'd highlight SecureKey here as an example in Canada of doing an excellent job of leveraging um, the the framework of your identity at a bank account and then leveraging that to use to authenticate into other systems. So it's not it's not a, a top down, it's more leveraging existing networks of trust to to do other things. And I'm I'm very supportive and very keen on on what they're doing, because I think I, I actually don't believe there's going to be a one solution fits all, particularly as we go um, across borders. It's going to be difficult for a for a, um, you know, a, a BC, a British Columbian um, digital identity uh, to be leveraged into some sort of U.S. financial institution, I think that like that's that's still a ways off. I think potentially blockchain solutions could help us get there, but I think in the interim, uh, being able to leverage existing uh, trusted institutions um, on a on a non-government basis, I think, are actually going to be really helpful to addressing um, on the positive side, uh, you know, ease of use, but then on the negative side, you know, being able to fight uh, fight fraud and fight account takeovers and, and fight some of the bad actors out there that are compromising the institutions today. I think this is something we see uh, Europe has been several years ahead on this in this places like Estonia and Sweden, et cetera, or uh, sorry, Switzerland. Um, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of use of, as an example in Switzerland, they really had a, a liveness uh, metric around uh, transactions over a certain value, uh, requiring people to have an authentication. It's it's a, a 15 second computer program that runs and documents a number of pieces uh, compared to places like uh, Germany, where you have to uh, you know wait for maybe 45 minutes on hold to access a live agent and schedule a video KYC interview over a very patchy uh, internet connection. Uh, and you know these are all you know in financial services. Uh, huge points of friction that you couldn't use in an ongoing basis. And uh, I think there's a, earlier on in the call, you mentioned Ian, the concept of identity proofing versus authentication. And I think one of the things we're seeing in this more, you know, call it remote work, call it decentralized uh, world that we're in now, everyone is, you know, that, that access management, uh, the the standard of authentication uh, is is definitely going up all around the world. On, on you know, it's no longer a password. And I think it's very important to think of the weakness of any knowledge based identity system or peer knowledge based identity system is just if someone shares that KYC information or shares that password, uh, shares that account in any way. Um, you 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 have a weakest link in your identity system, uh, and uh, I agree. Players like SecureKey in in Canada have done a tremendous job in providing an uh, an, an access sharing um, or or uh, an access sharing uh, a network, but there is the ongoing proofing um, that still remains a challenge in many of these networks. Uh, whether it's you know Canada with SecureKey or what you see in some of the other jurisdictions, uh, like you said, different jurisdictions have different networks. Uh, and in some of the markets that we work in, you see kind of the, a localized standard emerging. But at the end of the day, uh, you're, sh you're choosing some sort of secure protocol to share your information. Um, but then on an ongoing basis, you see there's, you know, still, uh, you know, video interviews or facial recognition or, or things like that happening, uh, which didn't, you know, could, couldn't even have existed five years ago if COVID had happened five years earlier. Well, I think if I could just respond to that, I mean, I think that the, the great news for everybody in the digital identity space is that there is a ton of opportunity. <laughs> there is there is absolutely a lot of uh, aspects here that, that we can go and improve upon. I mean, I just as an example, um, just recently, uh, myself and a, and a handful of other uh, digital leaders in Canada um, signed a petition with Parliament um, to to uh, uh, request that all financial institutions increase the base level of security to use some form of multi-factor authentication. Um, because I think as the point was mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of these institutions 
um, would like to do more, they can't because of regulation. And so I think that we all have an opportunity to uh, to voice our desire for, for higher levels of trust in the digital economy. Um, and so we can help that by by petitioning our, our elected leaders to, to address some of that regulation. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, whether whether we're talking about the initial identity proofing of, of figuring out if it's the right person or after that, whether it's still the right person through more of an authentication, there's plenty of areas here that um, that are, are ripe for improvement. And so what that means is a very vibrant ecosystem uh, of, of many players. Yeah, I just to add to that is that, you know, when you, whether you're talking proofing or authentication, I think biometrics are going to play a greater role um, in this, uh, particularly in talking about remote. Um, Ian, you brought up the, the whole example of physical versus digital, right? If you're physically authenticating and you have badges or security guards or what have you that are kind of going through that security check process. Um, you know, digitally, we're going to have to find the way to do it. And I think biometrics is going to be increasingly a part of that authentication process. The technology exists. It's the uh, adoption and proliferation of that, um, whether it's for individual identity or whether it's for corporate identity, you're going to have an individual representing that corporate identity. Um, it just in terms of, I think, networks of trust, back to that, I think the there is going to be a dramatic shift in terms of one entity saying, yes, this is the authentic person or an entity that is the corporate entity versus a network of people that are going to say, yes, we validate this identity, so to speak. And so when you're, when we're already seeing that, for example, in the corporate and the enterprise environment with Trust Your Supplier, um, where IBM in, in connection with its partners has developed now this network of trust. And so uh, there's a way to authenticate and identify people in that network, uh, whether it's vendors or suppliers or what have you, it's all identity based. And so if, some, if there is a bad actor, if something goes wrong, there is uh, an opportunity for nodes on the network to then say, yes, this was a valid uh, authentication or not, and if it's a repetitive sort of pattern, there's a way to deal with that. There's a governance mechanism to oust the bad actors. And so I think as we move increasingly into this digital environment, those opportunities are really going to come about where we're going to have to establish these networks of trust. And so to that extent, we're going to see, uh, particularly in, in the corporate environment, we're still going to see a large predominance of permission-based systems where it's you have to be a trusted node on that network. What does that mean? You're going to have to go through that vetting process and that authentication process and say, now you're a valid node on the network. So when you're talking about individuals, this is where we're going to see that private and, uh, you know, the, I would say the permission versus permissionless systems really kind of facing and coming together because uh, the biometric side to on the permissionless side is going to be an integral element of that. But on the corporate side, you're going to see these networks of trust where you have trusted nodes being able to validate an identity um, on the network and being able to deal with any, any bad actors. So there's an exciting, I think, roadmap ahead. It's not easy. It's complex. Uh, there's a reason why um, many regulatory bodies sort of shifted that further out into the future. I'm I work a lot in healthcare, for example, and in healthcare, um, you know, the whole HIPAA rule uh, is all, uh, surrounding privacy, but they kind of sidestep that whole discussion of identity, which is so critically attached to privacy, but they didn't uh, really address it because it was that complex. And I think we're finally at the point where we can now address that because it has to be addressed. There's so much fraud and you know, we, there, there's a, there comes to be a there comes a to, a to a point in time where you say we can't live with this fraud anymore, right? So what are we going to do about it? And so when we're trying trying to think about these new systems, new mechanisms, and to avoid the pitfalls of the systemic systems we've had, the, the, the legacy systems, we're going to have to rethink those models, and that identity piece is going to come into contact with privacy and part of regulatory. Sort of I agree. You know, HIPAA in Canada in, in privacy, data protection, identity, uh, you know, has been has been uh, a leader for for quite some time uh, on a number of fronts. One of the things, uh, as you know, mentioned earlier, uh, uh, or 
uh, was the Digital Identity Authentication Council of Canada, DIAC, uh, and, and some of the work that they're doing to, you know, there's a federation between <laughs> the identity and privacy and how is this managed, how much control uh, goes to either side of of the spec of you know the the operators of the network versus the uh, versus the users of the network almost. Uh, Nathan and and Mike, I'd love to hear from within the financial services world. You know, where do you see the kind of the the next steps uh, in in digital identity? Yeah, I think um, I'm going to touch a little bit on what Ian and Kevin were saying, which is. You know, I, I mentioned as good as digital identity can be from a financial service provider perspective, that only helps us uh, as long as we're still able to rely on it from a regulatory compliance perspective. And uh, the comment about lobbying and about what the private sector can do to push this initiative forward and quite frankly, just make the regulars, regulators' jobs easier, right, to say, hey, this is something that has worked in Estonia. This is how it was put together. This is what we've put together here. And here's how you can integrate it easier. Because the reality is these regulators are, they are often under-resourced. They have a lot going on and they're not going to be, they're not going to have the same expertise as the guys in this field who live and breathe it and who I learned from any time I talk to them about it because that's all they're doing, right? So I think that there's a lot of opportunities in the private sector of the people who have that expertise and groups like ours and companies like ours to stand behind that to say, yes, what these guys have put together works for us and these are the reasons why we think it makes sense and addresses your regulatory objectives. So I think that's something that um, is important and quite frankly, uh, from my end, I could, uh, do more to support that side of it too, just as an industry participant, because I think that's really the way to help get the regulators up to speed so that we can move this along more quickly rather than um, what I'd be, uh, I'd admit, you know, get caught up in the business as it is. And you think, you know, well, yeah, but when the regulators don't say we can do it, I'm going to focus my attention on what we're doing because my list is too long, I think it is an important element to it. And I think digital ID is a critical piece, not just from the company side, not just from the financial institution and regulatory side, but from the personal side too, from the UX side, as Kevin mentioned, right, right now, it's not as uh, effective, not as usable as it could be, and solutions are coming into place. But once it's solved, the you know, there is a very, very real benefit, especially for underserved populations who already have a harder time with, right? So they lose their birth certificate or they never got a birth certificate. And now what are they gonna do? They're already at a huge disadvantage with no real uh, opportunity to get out of that. So I think the implications of it are huge and, you know, everyone has their different part to play. And from our end, you know, we are, reliant on the regulators as to what we can do from a KYC compliance perspective. But we also have a role to, you know, work with these groups and figure out, okay, how do we push this forward in a way that helps everyone move, move ahead faster to, for the benefit of everyone. I think just to add on that as well, and um, to touch on one of the things Kevin mentioned, I think one of the biggest challenges uh, we see today is is the user experience really um, I think the underlying tech of digital identity and self sovereign identity is actually you know getting to the point where it's pretty well baked and we can we can trust and rely on it and start pushing it forward but the user experience right now looks like you know developers built it and we need to really push that forward and make it so it is really seamless and people can understand it and be comfortable with it and and know how to use it. Um, so I think that's a big area that you know people should focus on. And I think the second one I'd focus on is ecosystem development. Um, it's one thing if you're using um, you know digital identity internally, you know, between your business and your customers, but how do you do it amongst a number of organizations? And that's where you know our focus working with the the province, we're working with telcos, health um, health insurance companies, 
utilities, post-secondaries, because to me, that's where the, the real value comes, where we can start sharing different um, identity credentials between each other. So, you know, if I'd say there's two things to focus on right now for opportunities to create movement and change, it's the user experience and the building of ecosystems. I'm yeah. just jumping with what Mike said. Um, you know, again, trust your supplier. I think a great example of how that network um, is relating to the establishment of identity and of authentication. Um, so I think you know, as we continue to look to other success stories to develop these ecosystems, Mike, I think those are going to be some examples that we can look at and say that was a that's a, it's been well well designed and you know so far so good right and so let's hope it stays that stays that way um i think they just wanted to add to what you were saying too is that when you think about the future and you think about what is going to be really important for us uh, going forward that privacy element is really going to re be incredibly important and we have an opportunity to address that that from a technology perspective i think we do have some really exciting technologies. We've got, you know, things like zero knowledge proof, uh, homomorphic, homomorphic encryption. There's so there's technological elements that we can start to incorporate to ro make this much more robust going forward. We know we know where those potholes are. So there, th those are the opportunities for entrepreneurs and for corporations to enter into partnerships, if you will, and to develop much more robust solutions so that we don't end up where we are currently today, uh, really at the mercy of whatever else is out there. It seems like there's, uh, you know, we talk about these different ecosystems and, and these players, but one of the things that we've seen and we, you know, at iComply, our focus is really verification solutions. Uh, and what we've seen, a, a, a big push in certain jurisdictions now is uh, when you're talking about know your supplier is for proof of what was actually, uh, you know, what was the process that was actually executed to verify this person or this document and how can we prove that that was the process that was run at this point in time. Uh, and so the level of proofs are becoming almost like a certificate layer um, uh, and for, uh, for things like cybersecurity audits or even compliance audits. There will be uh, more reporting around, you know, how did you actually do this validation at that time? When is the last time you checked to see, uh, you know, the biometric authentication of the user who's behind the screen? Uh, things along those lines. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on, do you see that stuff becoming uh, more and more commonplace uh, because of COVID, you know, here in North America as, as one market? Um, do you see that stuff being accelerated uh, from your perspectives? I, okay, if I can jump in, because I was about to comment on the last one, but I, I, I was too late. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Please um, add to that as well. <laughs> well, my last comment, I just, Nathan said something that 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 triggered me that, that, um, that I hadn't really, not that I hadn't thought about, but that no one had brought up yet, which was um, kind of digital identity really leading to access, which when I say access, I mean, access for the world, uh, and what that access leads to is the diminishing, uh, diminishing of inequality, right? So I can tell you from from the fifth anti money laundering directive here in here in Europe, um, to onboard any third party national, there's only two documents we can universally accept from countries where we can accept clients, and that's a passport or a driver's license. Now, the vast amount of the, the vast majority of the world, in terms of population size, don't have either of those documents. So what do we do? We just can't onboard them, right? Now, if they were given some type of digital identity of birth, some sovereign ID of birth that's digital, then more than likely everyone would have one because there wouldn't be a cost or, or, or perhaps potentially there may be a cost, but more than likely these would be issued at birth. At some point they become issued at birth and they're issued maybe at a cost or no cost, but everyone has one. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, this, the, you know, right now for someone to get a, a legal document in some countries is just, there's no reason for them to do it. They're not gonna travel. Maybe they don't drive, they don't have a car. Um, and they get along with other identification types that simply aren't accepted on a on a on a on international level. So inequality is definitely something that this can help tackle. Um, on a uh, in terms of just being able to have access to services that 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 they never had access to before. Um, but on your last question about audit trail, so COVID is is a catalyst for, for sure. It's it's speeding up many of the transitions that we would have seen anyway. We would have seen these transitions regardless. We would have seen them maybe slower in certain parts of the world, but 
COVID is probably the only thing in any of our lifetimes that has been so macro, meaning that it's affected literally everyone in the world at the same time. I don't think anybody's ever really seen anything like this. Uh, literally, that's alive on the planet today. So in that sense, it's definitely a catalyst. So it's pushing us to move faster. As far as audit trails, blockchain specifically, or DLT, is abs it's absolutely made for auditability and traceability. So in terms of being able to have an audit trail on anything, of course, you still have to remember that garbage in, garbage out. So the more you can take some type of automation, whether that's machine learning, AI, as we as we start to progress these 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 types of technologies as well, because right now we have we use in our onboarding process that we created at, at one of my companies, we actually have our own audit trail that's built into a DLT. So the whole audit trail of the onboarding, every transaction, everybody that approves that transaction, even when a computer system approves a transaction, there is an audit trail. But there's still human elements, right? So when you approve something, maybe that's on a gray area, you write in a comment. You say why it's been approved, right? So there's still a human element, which means there still could be garbage in, and then it's immutable garbage, which doesn't really, you know, immutable garbage isn't any better than on a, you know, garbage that can be erased uh, to many for many reasons. So, but at, at, at the end of the day, those audit trails become very important, not just from a compliance aspect, but even from just an internal aspect of being able to train for trainings. Um, when we, when we, if we get external audited, obviously from a regulatory level or, or anywhere else. Um, but for sure, COVID has sped this up, but it, it was going to happen anyway, because it's just a better system. It's not because it's hyper, hyper innovative. It's not because it's the best thing since sliced bread. It's just, we had a three wheel car, like auditability and traceability and databases was like a three wheel car. It drove, it, it, it you kind of got where you were going. You couldn't take corners really well. You couldn't speed. Now we have the fourth wheel. So it's, it's just a, a natural progression. So DLT and these type of technologies are a natural progression, not only to, you know, to ID, identification and authentication and audibility, traceability, but to many different industries. So it's, it's, I think it's just a natural progression, COVID or no COVID. I think um, so I'll, I'll just tag on the concept of, of vendor risk management or supply chain risk is huge. And um, what, we're seeing just from a cybersecurity standpoint is um, you have to be able to protect and verify who all of the stakeholders are that have access to internal systems. And so, I mean, in in, in years past, that might have been easier if you just had 100 employees and they all worked in the building and they were all employed by you and it was fairly straightforward. You know, maybe with, with one or two exceptions, you'd have um, so people will come into the office, but it was, it was pretty straightforward. I think now what we're seeing is that uh, there's an acceleration to remote work. There's an acceleration to remote first. And so you have geographical uh, distribution of, of people, of stakeholders, but you also have outsourcing. And so what you now need to do is be able to determine the identity of your employee. And you also need to, to determine the identity of the call center worker at one of your subsidiaries. And you also need to, to, to ascertain the identity of the third party who's remotely connected into your data center to do some work because you have a support contract. And so it kind of goes on and on and on. And so with, with those different stakeholders, you have different levels of uh, control. And so in some cases, maybe you control the hardware they connect into, uh, but in other cases you don't. I think one one company that I would highlight doing some really interesting things in this area is Tehama, which is another Canadian company, um, and they've really focused on on enabling remote work, but specifically for non-employees. So how do you uh, securely enable access and enable the the stakeholders to get their work done uh, without um, compromising, both from a security standpoint as well as a data privacy standpoint? Um, there's certainly others in the space where we're working with a number in the identity governance space that are that are moving from a, a single point in time audit where you go through and once a year verify that everybody has the appropriate levels of permissions to doing that more in a continuous basis. And so again, there's some interesting things happening there. So from my perspective, we're seeing a shift to um, to dealing with the reality uh, of the new normal that we're that we're in. Um, but really, these things were already going on for the last couple of years. We're just seeing an acceleration of that now. Radhika, I'm curious. Do you see? Have you seen in your world? Um, uh, you know, I would agree with with this co concept that this has been something I think people in our industry have been building towards for quite some time. Um, 
do you see any changes in mindset uh, or, or or levels of reluctance to have things digital from, from some of the types of uh, companies you deal with? I think it depends on who you talk to. I mean, uh, for sure, I think just in, on the enterprise side, I think there's a, a much more um, magnified lens on the problems that have been mounting on the fraud side. And, uh, you know, it's uh, very clear that the growth of fraud is just staggering when you think about it, right? It's uh, $1 trillion of fraud going to $2 trillion of fraud. Um, that's a motivator, I think, for many corporations to take this seriously. And so the whole concept of digital identity has to do with risk, it has to do and management of that risk, it has to do with compliance, it has to do with uh, really mitigating all of the uh, the exposure that we are seeing time and time and time again. And so how many times is too much, right? And what's that tipping point? We are really kind of approaching that. And I think many or, um, corporations would agree or the majority of corporations would agree that this is now a priority. This is a business priority now. Um, so I think that when you talk about ecosystems and you talk about networks of trust, you talk about suppliers and vendors, for example, and authenticating those of suppliers and, ident uh, and, and vendors, you're also going to look at it from the enterprise perspective, from a, uh, from a point of view of cost reductions, because all of this KYC and AML point to point is adding up costs. And so one of the big motivators from an enterprise perspective is, well, how do I reduce my cost for compliance? So I think that when we start establishing these networks of trusts, that um, meaning we have these trusted nodes, we have validators on the node, uh, on, the, on the network that are going to say, yes, this is true, this is real, this is authentic. Uh, we can then say, well, that was a, you know, a, a valid authentication, if you will. And so all of those proof as well as authentication uh, identity uh, points, I think those are where we're trying to see how costs can be reduced, uh, time is reduced, uh, the time to authenticate is reduced. And so this, this becomes a more consistent method of bringing identity into the workplace um, and into relationships with um, uh, partners and vendors, suppliers, et cetera. So I think that's kind of where we're seeing. Um, is it going to be automatic? I don't think so. I think there's a lot of resistance from the standpoint of well, frankly, a lot of people making money off of fraud, right? And so um, and when you think about what the motivator is, that's what we're looking for. Can I just well, and there's also, yeah, comment? please. Uh, well, so, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think we're, we come from very a similar, uh, let's say, viewpoints in terms of technology. But I, I always try to go a bit, you know, even when, I, even when I'm fully uh, agreeing with something, I try to step back from myself sometimes and, and just try to think of where, where the kind of roadblocks are. And I think Nathan brought up the point as well about, you know, if today there was a sovereign identity solution, technically speaking, that was ready to roll, that worked and was amazing, I still couldn't use it at my business because unfortunately, and, and, and from a technical standpoint, I have to say that talking about this to regulators now for three years, there's no consensus mechanism that I can explain in detail to a regulator that they would accept as an actual way of, of verifying or authenticating any amount of information from an ID perspective. Just wouldn't work. Byzantine fault tolerance, proof of work, proof of stake. I can come in with all these different, uh, uh, and, and none of them, when we break them down to a granular level, to a regulator, usually meet what they believe the bar is for actually being able to authenticate information. And that's why they always step back and go, yeah, but, and, and, and what they step back to is usually even worse. I mean, we know it's worse. Uh, but, you know, no, you know, getting that authenticated, uh, you know, notarized passport copy, that's that's what stops fraud. And it doesn't at all. Of well, course, I think, I think it's a there's an important point is that the government system is trying to create a, a gateway of verification. Uh, and if you're just relying on kind of public key infrastructure, private key infrastructure, uh, you, you, you have an inherent weakness in your system that if somebody is able to air, uh, aggregate thousands of 
private keys, uh, which is a major issue you see in, as an example in the cryptocurrency industry. Uh, you can just spin up thousands of wallets, uh, have all those private keys slowly moving, uh, you know, a massive amount of money over uh, many microtransactions. Uh, and so there's definitely, uh, I think from a regulator's perspective, the protocol, the level tolerance, as long as it's secure, that's fine. But the governance of who can write to the protocol is usually the black box. Yeah, and they want the governance. That's... I'll, I'll just add to that, you know, on the government side, because um, from my vantage point of, of sitting, being a part of the California GovOps uh, blockchain working group, uh, one of the th exciting things that we're seeing is it takes the state of California, right? Pretty big economy. And so when we're looking at what we're enabling, um, one of the bills that just got passed, um, we didn't have anything directly to do with that, but I think it just expresses the sentiment around it and where are these tipping points of change. AB 2004 uh, just passed and it's a bill that's focused on verifiable credentials. And let's face it, that really comes down to identity, right? And so uh, how do we validate a credential, whatever that might be, whether it's a legal credential, it's, it could be a different kind of credential, it could be a, an educational credential even, but just credentials in general and identifying those credentials and validating those credentials. I think this verifiable credentials uh, space, I think is really of interest. And I think when you see uh, the state of California getting behind that and passing a bill to require that, that's pretty exciting to me. And so I look at, again, from an ecosystem perspective, it's not just going to be the private sector deploying or looking at these solutions. It's going to have to be where, to Kevin's point, policy, legislation, regulation, compliance, all of those mechanisms have to support the degree of innovation we really want to see because we know that that innovation is then going to solve a systemic issue. So the system of, of credentialing and verifying those credentials is faulty right now. Uh, notarizing something is, well, that can be frauded, right? And so this whole dependence on antiquated systems because that's a familiar thing, um, we're gonna have to move away from that. And I think government has a great role to play in spurring uh, good policy, good legislation, and good regulatory uh, mechanisms and frameworks to support that. Yeah, just um, jump in and, on a couple of points. One was the data risk that Radhika um, had mentioned, and I think, and zero knowledge proof that you referred to before. I think GDPR <clears throat> um, is really going to help drive a future state of data minimization. You know, over the past decade or two, we've been on this you know, data vacuum world. How do we suck in as much data as possible and use that data to, you know, create value? And I think with GDPR, it's going to create a situation where data is actually a risk and I don't want your data. I want to minimize the amount of information I collect about you because having that information is actually a risk for me. So I think you'll start to see, you know, on a, a global enterprise, you know, somebody's going to have that tipping point where they're going to go, we need to minimize the information we're collecting and self-sovereign identity and zero knowledge proofs allow that. I don't need your driver's license. I don't need all that information about you. I just need to know that you have a valid driver's license issued by you know, the province of Alberta, for example. Um, so I think that's gonna be a major trend that we're also gonna see. You know, It's gonna be over a decade, but that is going to be a trend that's gonna take place. And the other point I'll jump on too is around <clears throat> the keys issue and the comparison to crypto wallets. Um, the difference is that with a crypto wallet, it is absolute in that a key is controlling the value of that cryptocurrency that's stored in that wallet versus in a verifiable credential wallet. Um, if somebody stole the keys to my wallet and had access to it, um, we could actually, I could engage all the participants who were part of my wallet and have all those credentials revoked and I could get a new wallet. So the difference is I can actually go to the government and say, you know, I've been hacked, my credential was somehow stolen um, and have it revoked so it's no longer valid. So that identity credential um, is quite different than crypto. Um, so I think the the risks that are perceived around the blockchain components and the, the concern about keys is actually, is something we can work around and actually deal with. 
Absolutely. And there's definitely, you know, the concepts of wallets and, you know, as, you know, as an example, I've used uh, LastPass for many years uh, and, and, and some of these different services that do password management. It's, it seems that we could be headed for a world where we have similar types of solutions uh, for, uh, for things like our, our digital wallets, if you will. Um, I don't, Ian, do you see any of these types of applications and some of the clients you're dealing with on, on how to kind of manage things from a wallet perspective rather than uh, individual certificates? Uh, I mean, I think I think there's some really interesting things happening. I I am overall um, pleased to see that password managers are becoming more mainstream. Uh, I think LastPass, Dashlane, One Password, like these are all good things overall. I think it's a rising tide that lifts all boats, and I think that um, what it does is is decrease the number of reused passwords, which is really a, a key problem. Um, and so, if you you know, I think most of us now are kind of numb to the data breach emails that we get like, okay, well, my, my details were compromised at another retailer or, or something else. Um, you know, the really the damage from those breaches comes from bad guys getting access to your passwords. And if you share your password or if you reuse your password uh, from one account to the next, that becomes really problematic. And so um, password vendors specifically help address that problem and um, overall will increase your security posture. Now, take that one step further, and so if you can now secure your digital identity in, in sort of a similar way, these are all overall a net positive. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, I think that that's, that's overall good. I think that we're still early, particularly in the, in the corporate world, um, from thinking about uh, uh, stored wallets or, or wallets of identities. I think, I think it's still very early days. I think one of the questions that um, that I saw pop up, pop up here, which which is sort of related, is you know the the key risks and challenges with digital identity standards. And so the reason this is relevant is I think um, you know the the great thing about standards is that there's always so many to choose from. And this is true regardless of what you know what industry or, or what problem you're talking about. There's usually multiple competing standards. Um, and sometimes they're they're duplicative. Sometimes they're they're used for different things. I think one of the challenges that's going to come up, and this kind of relates back to the wallet conversation, is the interoperability between different digital identity standards. So again, whether you're starting from uh, a, a government issued digital identity, and then you're moving to the, something that you use for your financial services, and then you're using something else for your own personal use versus corporate use, I think one of the challenges may be that we have all of these great standards coming up, um, but how do they interoperate with one another? And are there um, consolidators, which could be in the form of a wallet, that enable you to leverage these different standards? So depending on the context, whether I'm currently using this for a business context, maybe I'm using my business identity, whether I'm using this on a personal context, and so I'm using my personal identity, um, how are we going to be able to to organize these at, at an individual level? I think that wallets are likely going to play a role, um, and so that's a space that I'm I'm looking at uh, and watching and, and hoping to see some um, some new innovations in that space. It just I, I think there's also a possibility that we'll see a lot more um, you know governments getting involved uh, in, in in some of these in some of these ways, but where you know where. You know what standard do you use to uh, you know to give somebody the access to their own wallet or that you know that self sovereignty uh, is is still I think a long ways out. Uh, you know we see well, we in a centralized identity foundation, right? And so I think that there are organizations that are absolutely answering the call to establishing industry standards. Now it may not be the only thing, but I'm just saying that there's already a big push. Um, so I don't know that it's too far off in the future. I think there are people absolutely recognizing that you have to have industry standards around digital identity and um, what uh, and the specifications around that. So um, there is a lot of work that is currently being done around that. There, there's definitely a, think there's... a lot of regional work, right? There's there's a lot of regional work that's happening around the world, which makes sense, right? You can't really do something like this globally without doing it regionally first. Yeah. The problem with regional with a very specific type of software or specific type of protocol or infrastructure, et cetera, is even a small change with each of those different protocols will make, make that the interoperability of those globally is going to be a nightmare. So the, 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 the and that this has happened in, in well, all tech, I mean, even on trade tech. So I come from trading, man, trade tech, 
I mean, settlements between capital markets. It doesn't, it doesn't work today. I mean, capital markets, most people think work pretty well. They don't. They're horrible. They're, they're the absolute worst infrastructure in terms of cross-border settlement that you've ever seen in your life. And the digital identity is kind of going down that same road because I see lots of innovations happening. There's there's innovation happening here in the Baltics and Latvia, Lithuania. There's innovation happening in the UK. I've seen uh, organizations like Radhika talked about in the US, in Canada, uh, in Latin America, in all over the all over the world, but they don't talk to each other. And if they do, they do so on a remedial level. And, you know, you mentioned, I think Mike mentioned, like uh, Mike made a comment um, at the beginning and he was talking about how he was in an onboarding process and was asked to link to his bank account and like ran away. And there's, you know, there's companies like Plaid and Tink in the EU. That's like, that's their entire business. And they've built billion dollars. I think MasterCard just bought Plaid for like $7 billion or something. Um, and so we're, we're, we're headed in that direction. But if you look at Plaid, that specific company in the U.S., you can actually authenticate a user's address, identification, everything right over Plaid by them logging into their bank account, which is great for the business side. Mike might run away from it. A lot of people might run away from it, but some people run toward it. But in the EU, the EU PSD2 regulation, which is supposed to be one of the best pieces of regulation that has come out of, of banking in the last 20 years, only gives you access to the person's name on the account and their account number. No address data, nothing. Uh, so again, even something as simplistic, not simplistic, but even something as you would assume that an open banking API would give you access to everything that the bank has that you would need to authenticate a client. It doesn't, even in the same region. So we we need we need an open, and we have all these communication, you know, we have Twitter and we have places like this and all these digital media that we can communicate with. This isn't 30 years ago. We don't have to send snail mail to each other or get on a phone or send a fax. And still we have a major problem with communication and collaboration. And that absolutely needs to change, especially for something like this to be successful on a global scale. And, and where it really needs to be successful, which is the hardest places to reach, Africa, uh, Russia, uh, you know, the CIS region, places where people can't onboard to anything, right? So yeah, that's a, it's a major problem. I'm curious if we, you know, of the people here on the panel, uh, if you've traveled uh, ever and used uh, any sort of digital onboarding system in an, in another country or at all, has anyone had that experience and and you know seen something that was quite unique to uh, to that jurisdiction that you hadn't seen maybe in Canada? Uh, I mean, sure. I think there's there's a um, fast traveler program that exists between Canada and the United States called Nexus. Um, there's there's a there's a few programs that that ultimately roll up to the trusted traveler program, and Nexus is one of them. Um, I think the thing that that's most interesting actually is it's one of the few examples I've seen of what appears to be two nation states um, exchanging data, and so. Uh, as a as a Canadian, uh, you go through a, a U.S. system, and there's there's a handshake somewhere in the background of, of data being exchanged back and forth, which I think is is quite interesting. Um, now the you know that's that's the pro. The con is that you still have to show up to a physical interview. Um, ironically, the last time I had to when I when I applied for the program originally, I was in the United States. I had to return back to Canada in order to go visit a U.S. embassy in Canada. To conduct the interview, so there's there was some hoops you had to jump through there, but um, I feel like it was a really good sign because the fact that you could have this um, these two nation states collaborating on on getting a program done, um, exchanging data was was a, a really good sign. Yeah, not, not very common to be honest. I imagine warring nation states. Well, that's I, I, Kevin, I was just you literally took that thought out of my head because I was just thinking to myself as we're talking about interoperable systems, global. Uh, interoperable systems. Uh, think about now the future of what we're dealing with, with climate change happening, um, the uh, many communities, populations rendered homeless, um, having to travel to other borders, um, now are stateless, are homeless, are having to establish identity to gain access to services. So I think Finland has taken some, some great leaps in that uh, sense of providing blockchain-based identity cards uh, to their refugees, for example. So when you think about, you know, we're not talking about just maybe you and me, but we're talking about the extended you and me, um, you know, who absolutely need these credentials to be able to have access to services 
Um, then there's Doctors Without Borders trying to look at migrant populations. How do they provide medical services to someone uh, who doesn't have paperwork, who doesn't have documentation? How do you deal with uh, this migrant identity, right? So we're really coming down to what we started talking about in the very beginning of this conversation, which is not just the ownership of identity, but the control of that identity and have that be borderless, right? And so we're talking about the whole concept of DID is that it's persistent, that it's private, that it's portable. And that's really what we're talking about. It's and not Mike, Mike mentioned that a very a very interesting point, which is when we was talking about the wallet of identity, right? Where, where there's multiple key holders that I can actually re revert the wallet should there be fraud. But that also means from a nation state standpoint is if that's the type of identification, digital identification that's adopted globally, that when they're at war with another nation state or they simply don't want their people to be able to travel across a certain border, they simply revoke the access. Someone gets to the border, can't get through, no, no, no identification or blocked, they're on a blacklist or et cetera. So, like with all this, with all this, you know, everything about blockchain or everything about DLT or anything, when you, especially when you drum it down to identification, but even from the the monetary side, your 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 you know digital money. Um, one of the things about that is is that when you talk about CBDCs and you talk about things that are controlled by governments, including identification, obviously these will, these won't be completely decentralized networks, meaning that there will be someone that has the access to be able to take away your 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 rights or your or, or your privacy or whatever and you know governments never let good crises go to waste they're usually pretty good at taking away uh, little pieces of your privacy I mean look at covid uh, I'm, I'm sure in, in the years to come we'll be looking at it like we did back in 2001 back in 2008 every time there's a crisis there's a little bit of uh, uh, privacy or or your individualism is, is kind of robbed from you now now with a passport that's paper I can still travel I can still go somewhere else they can't readily revoke it um, that easily um, well i think i think it's i think it's important to understand these government systems you know from if you're talking about traveling if somebody's um has a travel ban um that's already posted over a network that's the whether sure. or not they have a digital identity that's that doesn't change the operation i think we're i think we're more talking about the concept of uh you know migrating populations and Sure. If the uh, what was that Tom Hanks movie where you know trapped in an airport and your government government ceases yeah, to yeah, exist yeah. and your passport yeah. isn't recognized, you know, uh, it's, it would Great be no time. different than a digital identity. But then, how does uh, the government uh, of the U.S. then uh, you know looking at some refugees that have a digital uh, credential of some sort know whether this digital cre credential was gifted to himself as a fresh identity for a government uh corrupt government official or you know isn't an, isn't an, uh, an honest refugee uh and so you know there's i think there's uh there's a lot bigger conversation than just whether or not uh this identity uh or this digital certificate is is traveling with you and a lot more about who who will actually accept it if you if you do bring it to that border and if somebody comes to, uh, you know, it comes to one country as a refugee from another country, uh, are they able to see the identity? Uh, are they even able? And if they see all this information, uh, you know, do they trust it? And what sort of process does the government the of Canada country. have to accept uh, a digital ID from a refugee from Syria, as an example of something that, you know, Canada, we've had a lot of refugees coming through. And, um, and you know, if they had a digital identity system, there's a whole process when you look at whether it's one bank to another, whether, uh, you know, from whatever that network of trust is, uh, there's that interoperability component of how do you re-authenticate this information if you're receiving it, you know, um, bank A versus bank B. Uh, you mentioned earlier in the call, the virtual asset service providers, vast regulations and the travel rule, which is very similar to the correspondent banking regulation for you know sharing information associated with an account and, and there's quite a few organizations working on creating an international interoperability framework there which i think is actually quite interesting as a foundation of data sharing for a financial service provider um but i, I think you know on on a global scale we see you know there's different verticals there's government and there's education uh there's uh you, you know there's there's financial services there's the, in the private sector as a whole um uh, even people's uh remote you know remote workforces uh, all are having some form of digital identity 
uh, being built into it. And I think there's a, quite a bit of um, quite a bit of uh, a thought leadership that's been put out there from players uh, like the Pan. Uh, I think it's the Pan Canadian Trust Framework uh, was one example uh, of how a network could organize itself to be decentralized and and still have uh, you know uh, proper security controls put in place. Um, but I, I think you know from each of the people here on this panel, uh, it's been very interesting to hear you know the, the technology side, the financial side, the, the different perspectives in different jurisdictions. Uh, I really appreciate all of you guys coming out and it'd be interesting just in closing. Um, you know, if you look into digital identity in in your world, in in the world that you uh, work work in today, do you see? You know, what do you see as kind of um, maybe what we can expect to see in over the next three to five years? I'm I'm happy to kick it off. So so Matt and Andrew, I just want to thank you both for hosting and and Kevin, Radika, and Mike and Nathan. Uh, appreciated hearing your perspectives. Um, you know, I think I think that my lens is is quite specific. I mean, we're focused on authentication. We're focused on using behavior and AI as a form of authentication, which we find is easier than traditional forms. And so I think that uh, we're just going to see more of that. I think that we're going to see more use of, of AI and machine learning to provide better user experience while also providing better security. Um, there's a lot of other players in this space, and uh, we see that the, the space overall is, is increasing, uh, is growing, I should say. So I, I think that we're going to see more of that, and ultimately it's going to provide for a safer um, platform with which digital identity can grow. So I, I don't know the order here, so I'm just I, I'm just waiting for it. <laughs> Radhika, go ahead. No, no, no just, uh, I'll just say in closing, um, really echo the comments for from Ian, um, thanking everybody. The really exciting discussion, very interesting uh, exchange of ideas and and thoughts. And um, I'm, I'm personally very bullish on um, what we're going to see in digital identity. Is it going to be automatic? No, of course not. There's a lot of nuances and facets to think about, and they are all complex. And so, um, but therein lies the opportunity, right? So when you have these challenging issues and when you ha can't stand the status quo, which is really inadequate, um, I think that's the brighter future that I'm looking at. The world of digital identity is going to be redefined and reshaped and made much more robust and safer uh, to Ian's point. So I'm looking forward to a much better world from that standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, less fraud, uh, less, uh, you know, uh, loss of identity and uh, risks and uh, associated with identity as we move across this spectrum. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm actually pretty bullish on that. I'm, I'm looking forward to full, full on SSI DID based, uh, you know, digital identity systems. Um, and we would just have to be patient with the process because as we know, with any emerging technology, with any emerging space, um, there are multiple hurdles to cross. Some of them are uh, infrastructural sort of issues that are not easy mm -hmm. to, to contend with, but look at where we are today. You know, we've been enjoying internet for the last 30 plus years or so. I mean, we didn't start out with infrastructure that was friendly and uh, user interface that was uh, elegant and simple. I mean, there was a lot of complexity and it was a lot of clunkiness that we had to deal with, but we got through it. And so I think that that's the future we really can look towards as we build better UI, better adoption friendly types of interfaces for everybody to get onboarded. Absolutely. I, I think it's interesting you mentioned that, you know, the, the it's not going to happen all at once when you see what we've tried in different parts of the world from uh, Sync Pass in Singapore or ADAR in India or uh, different different countries having localized systems or localized networks. Uh, you know, what Secure Key uh, is doing in Canada as an example uh, locally. Um, it's really interesting uh, to see, you know, different things that work and then different things that don't and ideas that may seem great today, like UI of the internet 10 years ago may not be, may not seem very great in two, three years from now, even, uh, you know, as we continue to figure out new ways to do this better and technology improves as well. Um, Kevin, go ahead. I'd love to. Sure. So I, I, I I'm going to go a little pessimistic at first and just say that. I've seen lots of innovation in fintech in 30 years, um, and human beings have a natural way of taking traditional pain points and throwing them into new technology. 
So I expect a very interesting next five to 20 years as we try and as we make lots of assumptions on what's going to work better and how technology will make it better and then trip over ourselves a few times until we get to a point where there's a semi-universally accepted identification methodology that still isn't accepted globally, but maybe in certain countries. I think, I, I hate to say it, but I, I do think that there's going to be a lot of, I think somebody mentioned, I don't know if it was Andrew or Ian, I think it was Ian, about many standards, right? And in technology, it's very hard to have one standard on anything, right? Database, when I, I remember when database tech started to become the big thing 30, 35 years ago, and you know, the, everybody was talking about there was going to be a standard. This is going to be the standard. Stand, we still don't have a standard. Um, so at the end of the day, I think we're going to go down a lot of the same lines. I do think we're doing it for the right reasons, and I think it needs to be done. Um, I just don't think it's going to be that easy. I think the, the, global, the, the fact that we live in a world, the world we live in, is going to make it infinitely difficult to have something that is, act, that, you know, the people that don't need it per se, like the people that don't actually have the biggest problems with not having a sovereign digital identification will get it first. The people that actually need it are probably the ones that will get it last, which is usually what happens and it's unfortunate. Um, but hopefully somebody out there is going to tackle that problem um, because it's not a pro it's not it's not a, a problem that can be that's going to make you a lot of money or make you famous or, or put you in the in the record books. But it's probably the problem that most needs to be solved. So hopefully somebody's okay. listening that can tackle that problem. I think there's also the consideration that uh, you know there's a, a very big difference to between you know we talked about the concept of proofing or the concept of identity, uh, you know uh, authentication. But um, when somebody doesn't have an identity itself, that's actually a, a third component of this that we didn't even touch on. But creating uh, those identities themselves that will then be proofed is a whole another uh, kind of a whole another can of worms. Um, yes. Mike, just in closing, maybe uh, be able to share your thoughts as well. Sure. No, and thanks again for the putting this panel together. Um, I think for me over the next couple of years, I think the big thing we're going to see and I'm excited about is onboarding. I think it's going to be a key use case that gets driven forward. And you know, we've we have our system fully built to do a 60 second onboarding um, based on a SSI credential. So I think that's going to become the the norm. And once organizations start seeing that 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 model reduces risk, reduces fraud, and is a faster, more efficient experience for the customer. So I think that's gonna be what's gonna start happening in the next couple of years. Um, I, would, I would agree to that for sure. That's that's yeah. definitely the, the first thing we're gonna see happen. And I can't wait yeah. for it from a business perspective, that's for sure. Yeah. And um, I think on the standard side, I agree as well. And I think the work that's being done by the Trust Over IP Foundation um, has been uh, phenomenal, really kind of driving on the governance side of things and establishing a framework for that. So I think that work, and I think just to comment on some of the regional discussion that's taken place, I think there is good global movement. You know, I'm on, you know, work task force and one identity for all group that looks at how do we ensure identity access for everybody. You know, that has global representation. A lot of the sovereign community has very active global rep representation. So I think there is good global movement. You know, we're doing work on the same protocols um, using Hyperledger Indy and Aries that is, are being used in the UK, in Southeast Asia, in uh, in Australia, in you know everywhere. There, there's there's very good strong adoption of those self-sovereign um, protocols that are out there. Absolutely. Well, thank you everyone for your time. Uh, it's been it's, I always enjoy uh, these sessions, and I was really looking forward to this one because it's a uh, a topic that's uh, you know I'm quite interested in, but is also great to just be able to learn from uh, other people and hear these different perspectives and, and insights. Really, uh, because one, if if anything, digital identity is going to be something that is going to require uh, hopefully a lot of people to agree on how we do it, um, and and something that we're okay with doing as as a community uh, for for that network. So I definitely think it's a big uh, a big part of the future, but. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Mike, uh, and uh, and everybody else uh, who's, who's left. Uh, if you have any questions uh, in follow up, just post them in the comments, and we will uh, go. From, we will uh, talk to you there. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. And for the courtesy of our viewing audience that was able to join us today, I wanted to thank all of you for attending this fireside chat session on digital identity. Uh, you can find some of the panelists online and on LinkedIn. Kevin Merco from Coin Metro, 
Michael Brown from ETB Financial, Radhika Iyengar from Double Nova Group, Nathan Montgomery from Zafter, and Ian Pluralock. Thank you again, everybody, and hope you have a wonderful day.